Welcome to chapter 19. This chapter is all about viruses. So we are going to do a discussion about uh, general viral structure and viral replication and also viral evolution and talk about some um, subviral particles. So a virus consists of a nucleic acid, which makes up its genome. And this genome is going to be surrounded by a protein coat, along with other things in some cases. So viruses are simpler than prokaryotic cells. In fact, they are not even cells. So they're considered acellular. So the reason why they are acellular is because they, not, they are not surrounded by a plasma membrane, although some of them have a membraneous or a lipid uh, envelope but and also they do not have all the characteristics of living things remember uh, from chapter one where uh, the discussion about living things involved uh, several different characteristics at least four of them and viruses do not possess all four or all of those characteristics of living things. For one, they cannot uh, maintain homeostasis, so they cannot really undergo their own kind of metabolism and, and stabilize their environment. They uh, require a host, and they must use host components in order to replicate. So the genome can be DNA or RNA, both single-stranded or double-stranded. In the case of single-stranded, often there are some viruses that are, are single-stranded, but they may not go in the direction in which they can easily be read to make proteins, which would make them anti-sense single-stranded, as opposed to sense single-stranded. So sense single-strand RNAs can actually be uh, translated into proteins right away. The antisense must be converted back to RNA, uh, the sense RNA, in order to do so. They can have a linear or a circular genome. So the genome or the nucleic acids can be in the linear format or a circular format. The genome is very small in some cases, and well, all of them are small, but extremely small in some cases. So the genome consists of mainly the genes that are packaged in a protein coat. So again, the genome is the, you know, is the DNA or RNA, and they're going to be packaged up in this protein coat. And the protein coat is made up of, of uh, capsids, which make up capsomeres, which surround this, this uh, nucleic acid genome. Now, um, a virus can consist of as little as three genes to as many as 2,000 genes. So they are, uh, their genome is, in terms of size or the amount of genes, it varies quite significantly. Some, like I said, viruses have a viral envelope. A viral envelope is a, a lipid type structure and it's often derived from the membranes of the host cells. Viruses replicate only in host cells. Okay, so viruses require a host and that's the way they can own, that's the only way that they can replicate. So they're considered obligate intracellular parasites. They do have a host range. So some viruses, and what, this, what the host range is, the range of different species that they can infect. Um, so some of them have a, have a broad host range, which allows them to infect many different types of species, perhaps infect bacteria and plants and animals. Um, some of them are very specific and they may infect, uh, let's say, only animals or only vertebrates or even only a specific species of vertebrates. Now let's look at uh, the structure of some of these, and this shows uh, just four different types of very uh, uh, to, uh, viruses and their general structures. So here is an example example of the tobacco mosaic virus. So this is one virus that uh, infects plants, and you can see that the RNA is is in a coiled format. It's a single stranded RNA. And it's associated with these capsomeres, which make up the capsid. Okay, so the capsid is the entire structure that surrounds the RNA, which again is in a spiral format. 
and um, the capsid is made up of individual capsomeres. Now, if we look at this one right here, this one has a different shape. It's, it's an adenovirus, and adenoviruses are interesting in that they are actually used in biotechnology. So they're used to actually infect cells on purpose. But there are, I mean, where they derive from was adenoviruses that actually cause infection that we don't want. So you can see that this has, uh, this has uh, sides to it. And again, the capsid, again, is going to surround. In this case, it's a DNA virus. And we have the influenza virus. This influenza virus is more spherical than the adenovirus. You can see the adenovirus has many different sides to it. I believe it is a icosahedral. And if we compare the adenovirus with the influenza virus, you can see that on the, on the outside of both viruses, there are, um, it looks like spikes sticking out. These are actually proteins, and often these proteins are involved in protein-protein interactions that are required to get them inside the cell. So you can see there are less spikes on the adenovirus than there are the influenza virus. So if we took a little closer look at the influ influenza virus, we have many spikes on the outside, but the spikes are att attached to an envelope. So as you can see, the adenovirus does not have an envelope. The influenza virus does have an envelope. So this is a lipid-like envelope, and it can be analogous to the plasma membrane. However, it, again, is a virus, so it's not considered living, and mainly because they cannot um, maintain homeostasis. So this is a RNA uh, type of virus, and you can see that the RNA is associated with proteins. And you can see that we have a viral polymerase. The viral polymerase is uh, producing uh, the uh, complementary strand to the RNA. And here, the spikes, it shows that the adenovirus is just a protein spike. However, the spikes or the proteins or spikes that are on the surface of a influenza virus are glycoproteins, which means that they are proteins with carbohydrates attached to them. And let's look at one more. Um, so this only shows just a small portion of the types of viruses that, they, that exist. However, this kind of shows uh, representatively how different they can be in terms of structure. So this one is called the bacteriophage T4. So bacteriophages are uh, pro or, uh, not proteins, <laughs> they are made up of proteins. However, they are viruses that infect bacteria. These are also used in biotechnology to infect bacteria and uh, in some cases human cells. So they're structured quite interestingly. They have these tails and a sheath that surrounds the tail. And we have a fiber, many fibers, which are attached to the tail. So they can actually dock onto the surface of the cell. And you can see these spikes under here. This is what allows them to attach to the cell. They have a um, head. Okay, so it's called a head, but this is very similar to the other types of viruses, like the adenovirus. The head is made up of, uh, is a capsid, right? It's made up of capsomeres, and it surrounds the DNA. In this case, it's a DNA uh, a genome. So here, this type of virus can dock onto the surface of the cell using the tail fibers and attach to it using these uh, spikes right here, and then it delivers the DNA through this tail and into the cell. Replication of viruses and various different types of viruses. So we're going to go over the general replicative cycle, and then we're going to talk about some more details. So it gets a little bit complicated. This shows the general features of uh, replicative cycles of viruses. So the general feature is first um, entry and uncoding.
So some of them, again, um, they're, well, they are going to have a protein coat, but some of them have a membranous uh, envelope that surrounds that. But this one just says, shows one that has a protein coat. So they are going to attach to the cell and then enter the cell and then become uncoated. So these proteins are going to be removed and then the genome is going to be exposed. Once the genome is exposed, to this whole cell contents, then um, replication of the genome will occur. So here we see that replication of the genome is, is simply going to copy each of, or the entire genome in many, many different copies. But the genome also is used in order to make proteins or viral proteins that are necessary to make more viral particles. So this is where the uh, DNA, in this case this is a DNA virus, is going to be used as a template to make messenger RNA, which will be used to make the capsid proteins, which make up the capsids, um, or the capsomeres, which make up the capsids. So this is the transcription and, of course, manufacture of capsid proteins this is called translation. Once the capsid proteins are produced and the viral DNA is replicated, they're going to be assembled into new viral particles. And then once they are assembled into new viral particles, they will exit the cell and then infect more cells. So that's a general um, cycle image. So this is, again, we're going to talk about how um, the virus replicates. And if we look at this, we have a generic virus. Again, this genome can be DNA or RNA. But let's look at the, in the case of DNA. We have the viral genome, which is going to be replicated by the host enzyme. So again, the host enzymes are going to be um, used by the virus in order to make more viral particles. And the DNA is going to be used to transcribe the one copy of the DNA into a viral messenger RNA, which is then going to be translated into proteins. And then you can see the viral particles are being produced. Now, there's a couple different ways in which they can uh, be released out of the cell. So if we look at the left here, we can see uh, some viruses are going to release the viral particles. However, it causes the cell to burst so that the cell dies. However, the new viral particles are going to be released and then they can infect more cells and go through the same cycle. If we look at the right, they could leave the cell. However, leave the cell still living. So this cell is going to still be living, but it will still be producing these viral particles and just continue to produce viral particles. So the viral particles are going to be released, leaving the cell living and then infect other cells. Now let's talk about phages. So remember, we saw the structure of a bacteriophage and a bacteriophage is also called just a phage for, for you know, short. They have an all elongated capsid head. So remember the head. The head is going to contain the genome. And then they have that neck-like structure. And they have a tail, right? And then the tail piece has these fibers. But it's the tail piece that actually attaches to the attaches the phase to the host cell. And it allows the injection of the DNA from the capsid head into the host cell. So this is probably one of the best understood of all viruses. And again, like I said, it's used in uh, biotechnology in order to purposefully infect cells so that these cells can produce or uh, express proteins that are desired to be studied. So for phages, there are two alternative reproductive mechanisms, the lytic cycle and the lysogenic cycle. So as described in that previous image, the lytic cycle is going to result in the death of the host cell. So what happens is that the uh, phages are going to be um, released from the cell and it, it causes the cell to burst. This is a virulent phage uh, or a virulent phage would be uh, only lytic. Okay, so this is going to be uh, virulent, which is going to cause disease and damage host tissue. The lysogenic cycle is called a temporary, or examples of that would be temporal, temperate phages. Temperate phages actually use both the lytic and the lysogenic cycle. So let's look at those a little bit more in detail. So if we look at bacteria, 
Okay, so this shows the cycle, and this is the lytic cycle. So we can see how the bacteriophage actually attaches to the cell. It uses these fibers, and then it docks its tail onto the surface of the cell. So once it docks its tail onto the surface of the cell, it can inject the DNA from the, uh, from the capsid head. So this DNA is going to enter here. And what happens is the host DNA is degraded. So the host DNA is degraded, and then it's going to be, uh, so then the, the synthesis, the DNA from the phage is going to be used in order to produce the, the uh, proteins that are required to make more phages. And then um, the phages are going to be able to self-assemble by attraction and protein-protein and, uh, interactions. They're going to self-assemble so that the phages can contain some of the host DNA and, of course, the phage DNA. And then um, they're going to replicate and they're going to be released. And again, this damages the host cell. So this host cell will not survive. Once these phages are released, they can infect more, uh, more bacteria. So you probably remember this from way back when we were talking about horizontal gene transfer. So this is a way in which the genes from the bacteria and of course the phage can be transmitted between other uh, bacteria. So this is a way that the host DNA can be spread around. Now let's, so, um, those that are tied together, uh, this is what I was talking about. They are called, their examples are uh, temperate phages. So the temperate phages are able to, to undergo that, that horizontal gene transfer. So here, um, when we have phages that can actually perform lytic and lysogenic phases, we have the host cell DNA being injected, and then it's going to be incorporated into the host genome. So we can see incorporated into the host genome here. Here we're talking about the lysogenic cycle. So what happens is when during the lysogenic cycle, the, um, the, uh, it, it's going to be replicated, right? So as the, the, the bacteria double, the, the prophage, which is basically the genome of the, the phage, which has been incorporated into the, the chromosome, it's going to be replicated when the cell replicates. And then again, the prophage is going to exist here, and then um, it can uh, enter the uh, lytic stage. So again, like I said, these uh, processes can be utilized in biotechnology in order to uh, perform infect cells on purpose, and in some cases, it allows for horizontal. And like I said, in most cases in biotechnology, you can um, use phages in a different way where the horizontal gene transfer can occur. This is going to result, of course, in the production of new phages, and which are going to be released once the cell is damaged, and then it can infect other cells. In the lysogenic cycle, this is generally a temperate phage type only. Uh, remember, temperate phages can undergo both a lytic cycle and the lysogenic cycle. So as you can see, the lytic cycle is going to involve the virulent phage or the temperate phage. Only temperate phage can undergo the lysogenic cycle. But again, they can uh, basically uh, exit the temperate phase or the lysogenic cycle and enter the lytic cycle. So basically the genome is going to, the genome of a phage is going to integrate into the chromosome of the bacteria or the host. It's going to be replicated as the cells uh, undergo cell division. And it can be, again, uh, induced to leave the lysogenic cycle and then enter the lytic cycle under certain conditions. So teprophages are really interesting in biotechnology because um, under certain conditions, you can force it to go into the lytic cycle where it's going to eventually destroy the cells, but it's going to produce more phages so that it can infect more cells around it. Um, so this can be a number of different things that can cause that. So it can be certain conditions in which you desire. So you can you can actually force those conditions to um, to convert it to the lytic cycle. It's good because they. Now let's take a look at um, how bacteria can defend themselves against. Phage.
phages. So below we can see a string of DNA with uh, certain genes here. Now, foreign DNA can be identified by the bacteria, just like it's like the bacterial immune system. So they can be identified, and then what they're what's going to happen is they're going to it's going to be caught up by restriction enzymes. So self DNA is actually protected by methylation. So the normal DNA that's supposed to be there is going to be methylated, or basically the methyl group is going to be attached. Remember the functional group? It's going to be attached to the DNA, and that protects the DNA from the action of the restriction enzymes. However, foreign DNA is recognized because it's not methylated and that um, so that the restriction enzymes are going to recognize it and be able to cut them up. So this is the basis, ultimately the basis for the CRISPR-Cas system. So the CRISPR-Cas system is called the clustered, regularly, interspaced, short, palindromic repeats or CRISPRs. And um, so the spacer sequences in between. So these these represent the gene, basically the repeats right here. So the sequences in between the repeats correspond to DNA from a phage that had infected the cell previously. Now the CRISPR associated Cas proteins are nucleases that interact with CRISPRs. So again, the uh, CRISPR Cas system is something that's naturally uh, present in bacteria, but now has been used in biotechnology. So let's take a look at this process in which how bacteria can protect themselves. So let's say a bacterium is be, it being infected by a phage. So the phage uh, triggers the transcription of the CRISPR region of the bacterial DNA. So remember, the CRISPR region is going to contain these genic sequences. Um, they're ultimately um, uh, not really genes, but they are uh, DNA from infection by the same type of phage and other types of phages. And then in between are the repeat regions. So transcription is, this, is going to re, uh, produce an RNA transcript. And then after RNA processing, it's going to be cut up and form these short RNA um, loop-like structures. And here we can see this is uh, DNA, or this is the RNA, which is transcribed from the DNA from the same type of phage. Now, if you can imagine inside the cell, there are going to be other loops where um, this may be produced, right? So now we're going have a complementary RNA to this type of phage and this type of phage right here. Now the repeat regions cause the, the looping. Okay, so this allows the RNA to basically um, hydrogen bond with it itself and it creates this, this loop-like structure. And it's going to contain the complementary RNA to, in this case, the phage that is infecting the bacteria and other phages as well. So um, each of these RNAs are going to uh, basically interact with a Cas protein. So once the Cas protein interacts with this RNA loop-like structure, which has been transcribed because it was triggered to be transcribed by the infection of a phage, the complementary RNA is going to bind to the DNA of the invading phage. So remember, it's complementary to the phage that, um, that is, is invading the cell. And what this is going to do is bind to that, and it's going to, um, to basically cause the production of, well, the, the complementary RNA is going to bind to that. And then this is going to cause the degradation of the phage DNA. So the Cas protein actually performs the cutting. So the Cas protein is catalytic, where it's going to cut the phage DNA so that the phage can no longer replicate inside the cell. So um, this is very similar to our immune system. Once you have been exposed or once bacteria has been exposed to a particular phage, the phage DNA is incorporated into the genome. And then when it's, in, it, when it's infected again by the same phage, it can protect itself from infection. Now let's talk about viral envelopes. Many viruses, like I said, uh, they have a membranous envelope, and these are viruses that typically infect animals. 
Now, the um, glycoproteins on the envelope usually bind to a specific receptor molecule on the surface of the host cell. So they're, they're very specific, and um, many animal uh, proteins on the surface of their cells recognize proteins that have glyco, or glyco um, uh, components to them, which is carbohydrates attached to that. The viral envelope is usually derived from the host cell plasma membrane, and that's why it, it recognizes these, and it's very similar to the host cell uh, the plasma membrane with glycoproteins attached to it. Now let's look at this process right here. So here is a, uh, a virus which has an envelope and uh, it, the genome of course is going to be packaged by a capsid which is made up of capsomeres. And on the surface of the envelope is uh, it's proteins, glycoproteins. <clears throat> All right, sorry for the pause. I had to sneeze. Anyway, so um, this is going to allow it to enter the cell a little bit easier. So these proteins or glycoproteins on the surface of the envelope are going to bind to proteins on the surface of the host cell. And this allows it to kind of incorporate very similar to uh, the, um, the ways in which cells take in materials. So here it's going to kind of blend with the membrane. And you can see the viral particles forming it. And this is going to get in in that way. So then, of course, the genome is going to be uh, unpackaged. And then this exposes, this is an example of an RNA type of virus. And it's going to expose the genome, which happens to be RNA. So the RNA is going to serve as a template to produce more RNA. Okay. And then the RNA is going to be transcribed or translated into proteins. Okay. So the capsid proteins are going to be produced. And we can see that uh, some of the proteins are going to go to the ER where the uh, carbohydrates are going to be attached to. So if you remember that from German Biology 1, in the ER, this is where some proteins are modified. Also, now we have copies of the viral RNA. So um, once we have copies of the viral RNA, which is the genome, and we have made capsid proteins, and we the cell has made the uh, glycoproteins, which are going to go on the surface of the viral particle. Then they can uh, basically the virus can start to form inside the cell, and in this case, we can see the virus is forming um, the uh, capsid coated genome, and when it exits the cell, this is where the envelope is incorporated, right? So it starts to exit the cell and it's going to be exited like a, um, like a vesicle. So if you remember, the vesicles that are formed when exocytosis is formed, um, or is, is... Now let's talk about the viral genetic material. Now, the broadest variety of um, RNA genomes is found in viruses that infect animals. Animals can have uh, vetro retroviruses. So retroviruses actually use uh, reverse transcriptase to copy their RNA genome into DNA. And one example would be the uh, HIV virus, um, which is it's called the human immunodeficiency virus. This actually causes AIDS, and AIDS is actually acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. This is the result of being infected with HIV once HIV uh, becomes uh, more activated and causing disease in, in us. Let's take a, take a look at this process, uh, which is described in your textbook. All right, so we have the uh, viral particle uh, of HIV, which is surrounded by an envelope. Now, what's different about this is, well, what's the same is that uh, it's enveloped and it has glycoproteins attached to the surface and the genome is surrounded by a capsid which is made up of capsomeres. Now, 
inside the genome, this happens to be an RNA type of genome, but it also contains reverse transcriptase, which allows the, um, once it's inside the host, it allows the RNA to be converted to cDNA. So it's going to fuse with the host cell by uh, way of of protein-protein uh, interactions with the glycoproteins on the surface. And, um, and once it fuses with the host cell, it's going to be unpackaged inside the host cell. So the capsid is going to be uh, degraded and then the uh, genome will be exposed and the genome happens to be uh, RNA. And of course, inside the capsid or within the genome of HIV contains also the enzyme reverse transcriptase. Reverse transcriptase, again, is the enzyme that uh, performs reverse transcription, which is basically the use of the RNA uh, as a template to make cDNA. And here we have the single-stranded DNA being performed or uh, produced. And then the RNA is degraded, and then, of course, the DNA is going to be replicated by the host, and then this DNA is then going to be incorporated into the genome of the host. Now you can see this represents eukaryotic organisms because they have a nucleus. Once it's incorporated into the genome, this is considered a provirus, and this is going to remain dormant. It can be remain dormant for many, many years. But eventually it can become activated, and then once it becomes activated, the messenger RNAs are going to be produced, and, um, and then proteins can be produced pr to create the capsids uh, or the capsomeres, which are going to package up the, the uh, reverse transcriptase and then produce more uh, uh, viral particles, which will then re be released from the cell where it's going to gain the uh, viral envelope as it exits. So again, this is very similar to exocytosis and forming this, this vesicle-like structure, which is a viral particle. And then this viral particle is going to go and infect more cells. Now let's talk a little bit about the evolution of viruses and then discuss some things that are, are um, not viruses, but they are um, like subviral particles, which also cause disease. Now, evol viruses can evolve very, very quickly. They do not really fit into our definition of living organisms. And as I've mentioned more than once, they do not contain all of the, or possess all of the characteristics of living things. They likely evolved as little bits of cellular nucleic acid from other organisms. Um, other candidates include plasmids and transposons as the bits of cellular nucleic acid. So if you remember from chapter 21, transposons are uh, pieces of DNA or, or segments of DNA which are replicated and they can be copied and pasted elsewhere. And you know what plasmids are. Now, plasmids, transposons, and viruses are all considered mobile genetic elements. So remember, viruses, they're mobile. They can create, of course, they're, they're kind of, uh, they require a host in order to uh, replicate, but they are, they are mobile. They can um, replicate inside the host genome and then move to other cells via, you know, their, their uh, capsid and envelope components which attract them to that by protein-protein interactions. And you know how plasmids and transposons can move from discussions in previous chapters. But there is some controversy about whether viruses evolve before or after cells. So if you think about it, do you think a virus evolved before or after a cell evolved? So if viruses have um, components of cellular material and they require cells in order to replicate, then cells should have probably evolved first. But then if you remember the RNA world hypothesis that there are RNAs which are catalytic and it's thought that RNA was the first genetic material and it existed in a catalytic state without cellular material. So it's still a, but there are some uh, evidence of, of both sides. So that's something to ponder.
So let's talk about emerging viral diseases. So those that suddenly uh, become apparent. So we have um, sudden appearance of certain viruses. This would be concerning, uh, considered an emerging uh, viral disease or an emerging virus. Now, some emerging viruses had emerged previously, but then disappeared and due to one reason or another, and uh, they can reappear. So one example of what would be considered an emerging viral disease, even though it's been around for a, a while, uh, but HIV and the AIDS virus, uh, HIV virus and, and AIDS would be considered. Ebola is another one. So you have heard of some uh, epidemics in, in uh, certain countries where Ebola starts to emerge and then it disappears and then it reemerges. The Zika virus is something that was relatively um, recent. Influenza is, emerges pretty much every year, and there are new strains pretty much every year. Um, so we, these are just a couple examples, H5N1 and H1N1, uh, which turned into a pandemic at some point. And this is relatively recent. And of course, the coronavirus. The coronavirus, uh, you know, the earlier one, not this one from 2019, there was another one that became an epidemic in certain places. And now um, this coronavirus has become a pandemic. And the difference between an epidemic and a pandemic is an epidemic is going to be kind of localized to a particular region. And a pandemic is going to be where this virus, in this case, emerges all around the world. Now, in terms of spread of emerging diseases, um, so what are some reasons for emergence? Of course, mutation of existing viruses. Some of them, some viruses have a very high rate of mutation, very high rate. So if it mutates and then it becomes resistant to our um, ways of preventing disease, like a vaccine, then um, it, then it will, it can be reemerged. So the spread of viral diseases from um, small populations can, uh, can cause a reemergence or an emergence of, of particular diseases. And the spread of existing viruses from other animals, so the transfer between animals to humans. So these are three different possible reasons for emergence of viral diseases. However, there are a number of other types, but these are the three main um, hypotheses on how they spread. Now, reasons for increased spread. Um, so in terms of emergence, that's when it, when it appears, right? How does it become spread? Well, now, you know, once you have new roads and then people are moving around, right? So if we have new roads into an, a remote area, which, you know, let's say a virus was contained, now we have people going in and out of that remote area and it can spread to more uh, widespread uh, areas. And mosquitoes. So mosquitoes, uh, they fly, so they cannot be contained um, to some degree, and they can carry viruses and, of course, expand the range of the virus in, in terms of uh, distance, right? And perhaps uh, the uh, host range, right? So it could possibly expand the host range if it can be spread between animals and then eventually jumps from animals to humans, then that would uh, expand the host range as well. Remember that host range that we talked about initially. Now let's talk about some other things that aren't actually viruses. So we're going to talk about viroids and prions. You might have heard these terms before. And if you can imagine, a viroid is not actually a virus. It would be considered a sub-viral particle. A prion is also a sub-viral particle. And the reason is, is because they don't have all the components of a virus. So uh, what's interesting is a viroid is uh, generally a single-stranded uh, circular piece of RNA, which is catalytic, so it can't actually replicate itself. And that was thought that um, viroids only uh, infected plants, but we have found that uh, hepatitis D is uh, the infection from a viroid. It, so um, it can uh, spread in humans as well. Okay, so viroids are sub of a, a 
sub not atomic sub viral particles again it's just a piece of rna which can spread from one person to another uh, and in this case one example would be the uh, hepatitis d at this point i believe that's the only example but who knows um, there can be other maybe uh, hepatitis strains that could do the same or other types of viruses that can result or reduce down to just a piece of, of uh, RNA. Prions are, are, uh, are proteins. So they're, they're considered proteinaceous infectious particles. They generally cause uh, brain nervous system, uh, degenerative uh, brain or nervous system diseases in animals. So some examples, scrapie and sheep, uh, mad cow disease, you've probably heard, and Creutzfeldt jacob disease. And it's thought that prions can cause Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. Prions can be transmitted in food. So if it infects sheep or cows, it can be transmitted. And, and what, it doesn't really necessarily like infect uh, cells. Prions are generally un, uh, misfolded proteins. So they're proteins that are not folded properly. And when proteins are not folded properly, this means that there are going to be um, hydrophobic regions that are exposed to the water inside your cell. And remember, hydrophobic mixed with hydrophilic, it's like putting, putting oil in water. So the oil interacts with itself and it stays away from the water. Well, this is kind of what prions do. They start to uh, form uh, aggregates and, and uh, uh, large... Uh, um, uh, I guess uh, plaques inside. Plaques are basically uh, very large clumps of, of these misfolded proteins. So they can actually cause more. So we have a prion right here. A prion can interact with a normal protein and it could cause the normal protein to become misfolded. So it's, it's like a domino effect. So it, it, it basically, we have prions, which are misfolded. They're going to interact with the normal proteins and cause more misfolded more normal proteins and cause these aggregates, which create these plaques inside our nervous system. And it can, of course, disrupt the entire nervous system and cause a degenerative brain disease. So... Um, in summary, we, we have uh, viruses, and there are different types of viruses, different forms, and then we have things that, that can cause disease that aren't actually something that affects uh, or produces more, or in general, it's not going to produce more, but uh, it can cause more to be formed, uh, as in the case of the prions, right? So we have prions that can enter and then uh, convert normal proteins into uh, misfolded prion proteins.